Anyway, greetings tonight. I've got a, a theme that uh, I've been working with for many years now and just sort of putting a few more things together bit by bit. It's amazing how big the scriptures become when you've got a variety of their input and it takes quite often a bit of time to learn stuff and realize how it uh, balances across itself and cross checks with reality. But um, just a few years ago, we started off with a thing called the mercies of David and they're actually called the sure mercies of David and it's as serious as the scriptures that reveal where mercy and forgiveness came from and uh, answered the question, how could people say like David who committed adultery and murder, how could he be forgiven when the law demanded a death sentence upon him at a minimum? And not only him, it was his wife and uh, other people who his soldiers who retreated in battle and uh, basically murderers and uh, there's a whole lot of things there and obviously there's answers in the bible but there's a principle behind the answers and this is what we're really all about is learning these principles so we can further expound and unpackage the scriptures we go along i just like to just reveal a little bit more of these things you'll know all of this stuff but sometimes just putting it in a package makes it a, a bit easier to understand uh, matthew 1 verse 18 we're going to take up a verse which I used a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this is about Joseph. Now, Joseph was uh, the adopted father, if you like, or stepfather of Jesus Christ. He had a responsibility of actually raising Jesus. And uh, it seems that Joseph knew God very well in the way of God very well. He actually had a grasp on the mercies of David as opposed to what the legalism that was being presented to him by the Sadducees and Pharisees, which were common in the day. And we'll just take it up and make the point so you can see it's uh, very clear, easy to follow. He says in Matthew 1.18, he said, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Well, this is how the story goes. When his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, meaning that they were engaged to be married, they were able to go around together, but they hadn't uh, consummated their relationship. They kept apart. And it says here, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's two separate outcomes here. One outcome was that the Spirit uh, came and visited Mary and spoke with her about, would she like to be the mother of Jesus Christ? And she consented. Now, she's pregnant now. And at this particular point, Joseph hadn't been informed of what had happened. Now, Joseph thought, that she was pregnant simply to another person. He didn't know there was a spiritual connection here. I imagine he assumed that she had someone else who maybe she loved or cared for, or perhaps that she'd had a, a weak moment or whatever. She'd got pregnant. And this is where the story gets interesting. It says, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and this is very important the word just man this was the holy spirit leading uh, the author to write this and of course as we know matthew was writing this and he is defined by god as a just man and a just man is made up of two words a righteous person but a person who not only is righteous but who practices justice in other words righteousness and justice were one in his mind and it goes on to describe, this is the process how a just person who's under the law, keep in mind that by rights, Mary, according to the law, Mary should have been stoned to death. He could have divorced and had a stone to death. But this is not the course he took because he understood something about God's nature, which had been revealed. And so many people knew this nature. And we don't always know these things, but we don't live in the day. But we understand the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Ten Commandments, the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots. But there was a, another line of blessing running parallel from the time of David through to this time that these people were very well aware of. But we aren't necessarily aware of it. So this is why these points are brought forward, just to expand our thinking a little bit, not invent gospel or doctrine, but rather explain what is already known and just bring it forward so we can see it so we've got this situation mary's pregnant joseph knows he's pregnant he knows he's not the father at this point he doesn't know that it's of the holy spirit so in his mind and this is how a just man responds 
according to the word of God, because God was the one who described him as being just. He goes on to say, and not willing, meaning in his thoughts, he wasn't willing to make her a public example. So he's thinking if he's a just man, his thoughts are godly. His thoughts are the way God's would be. He's not willing to make her a public example. In other words, he's not willing to openly reveal her sin and bring shame upon her. Rather, he was just going to discreetly divorce her, put her away. If she had another lover, another person who she was uh, there, she'd be free to marry him. But he was minded to put her away privily. These words are used. They're not my words. These are used. And if you wonder or ever wondered how a righteous and just person doing the will of God thought, then here it is laid out very clearly. This is exactly, and this explains a lot that we don't always understand about the Old Testament, how the laws worked. Uh, many people, if I ask the question, how was it that King David wasn't put to death? So many people can't explain that because things happen between him and God, which are a running theme through the Bible. And it's not till we're explained or we have these things expanded that we grasp them. So we see here that Joseph knew what righteousness was, but he practiced it. And this is how a person practices righteousness. Now, he could have been angry. He could have been upset. He could have attacked her verbally and described. He could have insulted her. He, he could have divorced her. He could have abused her. He could have, there was all these things that he could have done, but he didn't do it. Now, there's something about his actions. He actually understood mercy. But why was he practicing a mercy which the law didn't allow? And yet he was practicing a mercy which God considered was righteous and just. Because all along, there was another line of mercy and blessing working parallel to the law, which most people in the Bible knew it. It's just that it can be new to some of us. And keep in mind that not only did he understand mercy, he actually was the the uh, person who had responsibility to raise Jesus, teach Jesus, and bring about blessing in Jesus' life. And this is what he was doing. So this is how a righteous man acts. And when you understand the type of tutoring he would have offered Jesus Christ, you can start to begin how Jesus was so well taught and so well versed in principles that by the age of 12, he was able to tackle the, uh, the, the priests, and the scribes, because they didn't necessarily agree with the mercies of David. Not that that was the only topic. He would have been, uh, tackled many topics, but they didn't understand these things because they were so tied up in legalism that they had everyone under the thumb. Everyone was downcast. Everyone was downtrodden. And they just couldn't comprehend how someone like Jesus Christ as he eventually became an adult, would come, do all these miracles. They couldn't work out how it was possible because he seemed to be breaking every known law, which they'd invented, but they didn't realize there was another law at work which had already been established. And not only was it established, it was actually a covenant agreement, which we'll uncover shortly. So just while we consider this point, at, at this time, Joseph was under the law. He's not spirit-filled. Jesus is a baby or a, a, a not even born yet. So here he is. And this is what a just man does. But in verse 20, he explains it just a little bit more. But while he thought, meaning while he was pondering the things of God, while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, now, it's very important that we grasp the fact that he's titled the son of David because he was the descendant of David, and he also understood what the sure mercies of David were. And for those who haven't heard the term, the sure mercies of David, they're used multiple times, at least three or four times in the Bible. They're a genuine uh, statement, and we'll have a look at one or two of them in a moment. Now, he said, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, when he heard that Mary and all the good things that he loved and thought about her hadn't been tainted, that it was true, and that this was something of God, he agreed wholeheartedly to take the role of fathering the baby Jesus and to teach him and guide him and all the spiritual principles that would be needed 
for him to develop into an adult with a, an awareness of the principles of, of God. So what we see here, that his choices and action, actions actually reveal how the sure mercies of David were understood and practiced by faithful people. Joseph was not seeking mercy for himself. It's not like King David who was after mercy. Joseph was actually offering mercy. Huge difference. He was offering this to Mary. He was not asking it for himself. He was offering it to Mary. And this, again, is a huge part of comprehending how mercy and forgiveness work. So let's go back to Psalm 51, verse 12. And we're going to have a look at the origins of the sure mercy of David. And this psalm is one of a couple of psalms. And this came after David had committed a adultery with Bathsheba. He got himself in one big mess. And you can read the whole uh, psalm here in Psalm 32 is another irrelevant psalm. And there's a whole list of things that can, we can cover. But I just want to get this concept of the mercies of David. This is how they came about. So we see here in Psalm 51, verse 12, and he says uh, here, restore unto me. Now, he's gone through a whole list of things about what he loves about God. This is David as a king. All the things he loves about God, his full awareness and understanding of God, which is probably greater than even many of us spirit-filled people have today. He seemed to know a lot more about God at every known level of how God functions, of how he treats people. He actually understood the nature of God. The Bible says he had a heart that pleased God, meaning his thinking was pleasing to God. His comprehension of the principles behind the Godhead God was thrilled with him. Part of his appeal, and this is the point I want to make, he says in verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What David did here, because he had a heart that pleased God, he acknowledged his sin. He says earlier, I didn't hide it. I acknowledge it. I confess before you. He said, I know I've sinned against you. I want a remedy out of this. And because he was pleasing to God and he didn't hide things and he wasn't like uh, Saul who uh, was sort of in it for the glory and the ego, this guy, even though he did something terrible, he was able to be humble and sincere and he was able to maintain that sincerity. And this is what God wanted. So he made an offering to God that, I'd like to make a covenant with you. You forgive me my sin and I will teach transgressors. I will instruct them and show them all your ways and sinners will be converted unto thee. Now, the, the concept of sinners being converted is both unsaved, restoring, uh, finding salvation and the saved who have moved away, being able to be restored. And it's interesting that this is actually what Joseph was practicing as the victim. He was actually practicing what David had pleaded to God for to get a covenant that would work for the human race. Now, interestingly, if we move on to Solomon, which is 2 Chronicles 6.42, Solomon actually requested the sure mercies of his father. Now, to cut a long story short, they just built the temple. This is the first temple, first stone temple ever built. Solomon standing there, very nervy, afraid, not... Uh, afraid that he's not measuring up to the spiritual requirements. And he, he made this little prayer to the Lord in 2 Chronicles 6, 42, which is the last verse. He says, O Lord God, turn not away the face of thine anointed. Remember the mercies of David, thy servant. He wanted God to remember the agreement he'd made with his father, David, and he wanted that blessing to be part of his life. Because you might remember when God asked him what he would like if he would be king, he didn't ask for money, power, or the death of his enemies. He wanted wisdom to care for the people. Now, this is the type of heart that God wants. He wanted wisdom to care for the people. And as he laid out this second petition of huge wisdom, Lord, if you give me the mercy my father had, I know it'll be a blessing to me, but he knew it would not only be good for him, it would actually be good for the people who we would be ministering unto and setting an example for. Now, if you read the next verse, 
you find it, it says after he finished praying, the fire of God came down, consumed the burnt offering, and the Holy Spirit moved into the temple for the first time in history. Th this is a big point. This concept of the sure mercies of David, uh, God answered that prayer request and it came directly after he finished these prayers that God honored this. Now, if we move into Isaiah 53, 3, I'm not making this too complex. I'm just showing you a pattern continuing. David asked God, God confirmed it. Uh, Solomon asked for exactly the same blessing to be upon his ministry. God confirmed it. And now we're going to see in Isaiah 55 and verse 3, and for those who know uh, roughly the book of Isaiah, the bulk of Isaiah is relevant to the church age in nearly every avenue of its discovery and its writing, but it's also relevant equally to the different bits and pieces of history uh, when these things are being written. But there's a strong spiritual backing behind this that says this is for the church. And I, I don't need to prove it. I think you've probably heard a lot of stuff that would indicate that's how it is. So Isaiah 55 verse three says, incline your ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live. And he says, and I will make an everlasting covenant. It, notice these words, an eternal covenant, everlasting with you. And he now goes on to describe what this covenant would be, even the sure mercies of David. So not only was it relevant to the age they're in, it's actually become relevant to the age you and I are in because you and I, even though we have forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins we have are the extensions of the sure mercies of David. And it's interesting that the uh, when Paul writes about these things, he actually describes it this way. So now we've sort of set the scene. We know what the sure mercies of David are, how they came about, what they uh, include. They ran through the whole of the old covenant. They ran parallel to the law. And this is how God was able to forgive and deal with so many people who perhaps should have had the death sentence, who didn't get it, or other penalties. And uh, we move into a time now where we see this is a covenant promise, an eternal promise, and you and I now have, because of what David pledged with God, that we would have this eternal covenant, you and I have inherited this covenant. Let's read it. Acts 13, verse 34. So what happens here? Paul confirms the covenant promise that was given and the sure mercies of David are now part of the ministry benefit we have as spirit-filled people. He says in verse 34, and as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He, this is referring to Jesus Christ. He said on this wise, I will give you what? The sure mercies of David. This is what Jesus Christ said to the church. I will continue this covenant through. The difference is that Jesus Christ, unlike the priests and the others who had gone before the kings, they were mortal. When they died, they corrupted. In other words, their body rotted and that was the end of them. Then they had to train a new person. There's a whole series of conflicting people and people who didn't have faith and people who didn't act wisely and wars and all these things came and went. But ultimately, Jesus Christ came. What did he do? He confirmed the covenant agreement which God made with uh, David and extended it and confirmed that his extension was now valid within the church system. And this is very important. Jesus Christ didn't come and invent forgiveness. He made an eternal priesthood possible because he doesn't die physically, because he's eternally on the right hand of God interceding for us. And this is nearly all the promises in the book of Hebrews about what a better priest we have, what a better covenant. It didn't replace many of the covenant promises. All it did was made it possible for these promises to work better and to be without limitation, which happened when men died, they had to find a new priest and they didn't necessarily get a good one. But under Jesus Christ, the goodness of the mercies of David that was included in it and the intention of what God put became part of our covenant. We'll read in verse 35, wherefore he saith also in another Psalm, thou shalt not, not suffer to have thy holy one see corruption for David after he served his own generation by the will of God fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption and verse 38, be it known, unto you therefore 
This is now a conclusion. He sort of ratified a few of these things. He explained a couple of things. Therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. How was the forgiveness of sins made possible? Yes, he died on the cross. But there was a covenant already underlying that. And that were the mercies of David. And this has already been said. This is part of the package that you and I have. We have this pledge of a covenant of mercy and forgiveness. And it's actually bigger than mercy and forgiveness. We'll get into it in just a moment. And he says in verse 89, continuing on with the benefit of this covenant, and by him all that believe, and, and that we know the context of believe, the spirit-filled people, they're people who've got the spirit and continue to walk in it. And by him all that believe are justified, meaning that we're freed from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So here he is now explaining how this parallel of forgiveness and mercy ran parallel to the law and the law of Moses. But now we have a priest where this is never going to go away. Now we don't, we're not going to be let down by high priests who are jealous and full of hate and just want money and uh, can't, couldn't wait to bump off Jesus Christ so for their own gain and they lied and cheated and things. We, we don't have that. We, we've got a high priest that can't be corrupted. And again, that gets back to all the promises that were made in the book of Hebrews about what he would do and what he, he could do for us. I'd like to take the theme a little bit more, the concept of how the people saw David as a person and what he was offering them. So let's have a look in Matthew 9, verse 27. And this is on the day. This is before the Holy Spirit. This is when Jesus is ministering under the law. And we've already had expressed to us that this was outside of the law, ran parallel to it. So this solves the problem of how so many people got away, if you want to use those terms, got away with or were able to be reconciled with things which really demanded a death sentence. And that's confusing uh, in its own right. But we know that we know an answer to this, which is really good. So there was actually more than the forgiveness of sin. The mercies of David quite often included restoration of health and an awareness that the power of God could do more. See, forgiveness is against sinning, but forgiveness is a bit more than against sinning. If we're born into sin, it means that we have a nature which is lost to God by nature, even without an action, before we do something wrong or think something wrong, by our status as fallen, as Adam and Eve fell, by the status where sin is by nature, God is able not only to forgive the sin of the nature, but the problems that come from natural or the nature of sin as opposed to acts of sin, uh, which sickness, sickness came into the world and a whole lot of other things came into the world. And we're not sick because we've done a sin. We're sick because humanity is in sin. It's a process where things go wrong. And we all know all about that because we have so many prayer requests uh, so frequently and we have responses. So we're going to just read this here, Matthew 9, 27. We see here that there's more than just forgiveness of sin. Then, and when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him crying and saying, thou son of David, Notice these words. See, if you don't understand the principles or haven't sort of had a chance to work them out, then the concept of the term, thou son of David, it doesn't mean a lot. But interestingly, he didn't say son of Abraham. He didn't say descendant of this or descendant of that. It was son of David because they knew they had a covenant. They knew David had been blessed by God and had given them so many promises. They just didn't have a priesthood who was prepared to honor it. The priesthood was almost totally corrupt. And that's why when Jesus came, he wasn't corrupt and he, he was enacting the promises that were already contained within this covenant, which all the people knew. And they dared believe that maybe this man could do it. And that's why they were there. That's why the woman said, if I just touch his garment, I'll be healed. And she was healed. And a lot of them got blessing because they understood something that we don't always grasp. And it's not we're dumb. It's just there's all these things where we're ever learning, ever learning. And praise God, the, the quality of the talks we get every Friday night here in our meetings, we've got continuous expansions of our knowledge base. 
continuous different ways to say how God's promises work. We've got testimonies. We just got examples of God fulfilling these covenant promises, which is really a remarkable thing. Anyway, so he says, thou son of David, what do you say? Have mercy on us. Why did they say have mercy on us? Because they knew that David had offered to show mercies, but they weren't after forgiveness of sin. What were they after? Verse 28, and when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said unto them, believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, yea, Lord, then touched he their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. You know what happened? They were healed because part of God's mercy that was offered through David was restoration before the Lord and it included healing. But up until this stage, who were the priests who were going to honor this? Who were the people who were going to impart this knowledge and wisdom to expand these promises? And who was going to be faithful enough to honor it? Well, Jesus did. And this is what we have. But what we're starting to realize is that these promises had been there all along, but there was no mechanism to deliver them. There was no priest in a good position to honor them without corrupting themselves or dying of old age or getting bumped off by a, a jealous priest or something. Jesus, this is why these promises, when you read the book of Hebrews and look at the promises that are made about the priesthood, this is part of the backstory. This is part of the reason why these promises are made. It's not just all laid out that old covenant bad, new covenant good. The old covenant had good stuff running parallel, but it never had the right person running it. They never had the availability to have a spiritually powerful person who wouldn't default. So the Pharisees, the priests, they corrupted the mercy and the forgiveness that David had gained. They'd legalized many of the Bible promises to the point where they just simply unworkable. So people were paying money for sacrifices and there was a bit of a, a franchise arrangement where the family members sold the turtle doves and sold the sacrifices and money for the exchanges was made. This is how corrupt the system had become. And when Jesus came, he tipped up the table and he rebuked these people, not because they were evil, because they were naughty. It was because they had blocked the people from the mercy and the forgiveness which had been available since the time of David. Over a thousand years, they had totally corrupted the promises which David was able to offer them. That's remarkable. Absolutely remarkable that these things were always there, but they never had a delivery mechanism to do it. Now, you and I today, when we use the gifts of the Spirit, we have a mechanism whereby we can speak in tongues. Because why? We have a mediator. Jesus Christ couldn't speak in tongues because there was no one sitting on the right hand of God to mediate or to orchestrate the words and the promises and the language associated with them. So it wasn't until he sat on the right hand of God. And as we know, a month and a bit later, the Holy Spirit's poured out. All of a sudden, we now have a clarity. We receive the spirit. We speak in tongues. We find that the gifts of prophecy is now a right because there's a connection with God with a person who's ever interceding on our behalf. And he delivers wisdom and knowledge and the ability to discern. Discerning of spirits is in one way and probably the main way. It's just the ability to work out between right and wrong. But God delivers these thoughts to us because it's a promise. Then the laying on of hands for the sick. It's a working mechanism or something that happened before, but it was plagued in the past. Like we said, there was too much corruption and from time to time it worked, but the people knew it was possible. That's why on numerous times, not just once, numerous times people came up to Jesus and said, son of David, heal me or do this or do that, because they knew it was an authority granted to David and they'd found someone who actually believed God and worked with God enough to make it happen. And this is what's happening. Now, just to summarize these points, because we're sort of down to just a short bit of time, the ability to overcome this world is actually demonstrated by our willingness to manage this absolute freedom we have in the Lord. We're told we're free to do all things. And I know it becomes a little bit debatable, but just philosophically to go through the mathematical debate, 
there's no sin you can't be forgiven of except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and without turning a long argument into anything more convoluted than needs be. The very simple process means that if you reject the Holy Spirit, your process or mechanism to be forgiven is cut off. So you can't be forgiven while you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the source of your contact or your connection with God. So to blaspheme the Holy Spirit simply means the pipeline that has the waters of life is turned off. Therefore, you can't be forgiven. The sin isn't that you're blasphemed. It's actually the process of shutting down the mechanism which delivers you. And this is why he went for all these things. All manner of sin shall be forgiven. The things that could not be forgiven under law now can, et cetera, et cetera. So to just sort of close off this thinking for us in the church, there's really nothing that we can't sort of recover from in the Lord, but that's not what overcoming is about. Overcoming being God's people on the earth is knowing we have freedom to make choices, knowing that whatever we do, ultimately God can forgive us if we can repent. But God won't be mocked. People think they can just do dumb stuff, say sorry, dumb stuff, say sorry. In the end, God will take them out because he won't be mocked. And it won't go well for people like that. But it doesn't alter the fact that the real test of our overcoming is knowing that we have absolute freedom to do whatever we like, good or evil, in one sense. And I'm not trying to justify sin. I, I, there might be arguments. I'm not trying to go down this track that no matter what you do, you can willfully live a sinful life and say sorry and it's all over and God will recover you. That's not what I'm saying and I don't want, I don't want to have to qualify all that. But in simple terms, the principle behind your, your salvation, my salvation is God can forgive us whatever strife we're in. And the overcoming thing is that regardless of our freedom, we still choose to serve God. Regardless of our freedom, we still choose to serve God. How do we do that? The parable of the sheep and the goat summarizes it perfectly. I won't go through it, but simply to summarize that point is the ones who are found in favor and the ones who were blessed were those who offered this wonderful mercy and forgiveness and love and care to their fellow brothers and sisters in the church and to the people in this world where opportunities arose. We've all got different backgrounds. We've all got different workloads. We've all got different things. But ultimately, we can use the power of God to ask God to change our life, change our circumstances, and give us more time to serve him, and he will bless us even better than what we achieve in our natural understanding. So just to summarize this, the sure mercies of David are quite old, nearly 3,000 years old now, but they're working far better now because they've got a better priest. They're built with a better covenant surrounding it, and I believe that we're far better educated and far more knowledgeable so brothers and sisters in the Lord, just remember there's no limitation on what you can do in the Lord, but just allow yourself not to be taken into the world. The time is close. The Lord's return is near. Amen. Thank you.